Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I think we can get started now. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world, um, and welcome to the first session in our AI virtual tech talk series. Uh, my name is Rachel, and I work in the IoT developer ecosystem team at ARM, um, and I'm going to help moderate today's session. Um, so whether you're working from home or whether you're back in the office, we hope these tech talks will help you in your machine learning development. Um, as you can see on the screen, if we just move to the next slide. This is the first um, tech talk in the series. Um, we have a tech talk every other week and each tech talk will be delivered by ARM um, or one of our leading AI partners. Um, if you'd like to register for any future talks, simply just visit that link on the bottom of the screen. Um, so for today's session, um, I'm joined by experts from ARM and NXP um, to discuss how you can efficiently accelerate machine learning on low power Cortex M based devices with open source software libraries and tools. The two speakers of this session are Cobus and Anthony, who I'll now hand you over to so they can introduce themselves. I'll hand over to Cobus first. Hi, good morning. I'm Cobus Marnovic. I'm a product manager at ARM. I've been at ARM for about two and a half years now, and I'm responsible for the Cortex-M products, specifically the M Cortex-M33, the Cortex-M7, and the Cortex-M35P, as well as uh, related uh, reference designs, the core stone packages. Hi, and I'm Anthony Hirika. I'm a systems engineer with NXP uh, for over a decade now. I'm located in Austin, and I am currently working on the AI ML solutions uh, and software that we'll be talking about today. Great, thank you. So I can see you're both still working from home. How's the working from home setup going so far? Um, it's been going okay for me. Um, I, I was working from home one or two days a week before the uh, lockdown. So um, it wasn't that different. I am fortunate to have a nice office with a nice view over my backyard. So um, I cannot complain. Great. Yeah, same, same for me. I work from home occasionally and now it's just all the time, but I got a good setup and it's been working out for long. Great. And have you got any tips for switching off from work? You know, you're often, when, if they're working from home, you're often working many more hours. You got any tips for switching off? Uh, one of my friends set up a happy hour at five on Friday. So that way to make sure that we always stop at five o'clock on Friday um, and not go over because it's so easy to. So that's been helpful. Nice. Yeah, I, th I think in my case, if you, if you do have a, a home office that you can close the door and, you know, shut down, um, it makes it easier. If, if you're sharing safe space, um, it, it, it probably makes it a little bit more difficult. But I think just closing your office door and walking out, I think that helps to shut down. Great. Okay. So before we get into the presentation, I thought it would be good for everyone to get to know you both a little bit better. Um, I know we can see your working from home setup, but I hope these, um, this little introduction will help a bit more. So I'm going to... Um, I'll do a quick fire round with both of you, if that's okay. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I hope you can answer as quickly as possible. So just five really quick questions. So Cobus, let's start with you. Okay, favorite city in the US besides Austin? San Diego. Savory or sweet? Uh, savory for main course, sweet for dessert. <laughs> Working from home or in the office? Uh, mixture. Go or Python? Python. Favorite develop, development board? Um, probably this one from NXP. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> okay, over to you, Anthony. Quick questions. Cats or dogs? Uh, dogs. Beach or mountains? Uh, actually, cities. All cities. Good option. Favorite development board? Uh, probably the RT1060 because that's what we're going to be showing the demo on. Oh, hey, <laughs> working from home or in the office? I actually like working from home. It's, it's quite nice not to have a commute anymore. And cafe or PyTorch? Uh, PyTorch. Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. That was good. Um, I think, Anthony, you're a bit quick, quicker than Cobus. Cobus, you stalled a bit there. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into this presentation. So before we get started, I'd like to let you know how to submit your questions. 
Um, there's a Q&A button in your Zoom control panel. Uh, when you click this button, a question and answer panel will appear. Um, you simply enter your questions in this panel and submit. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions throughout the session, so don't hesitate to ask questions as we go. So I'll hand you over to Cobus and Anthony. Anthony, to start today's session. Sure. So today we're going to be talking about ML on the edge and a little bit of overview of that. And I'm going to talk about EIQ and how SimpsonSynN and ARM cores can help accelerate the uh, machine learning inference that happens on an embedded system. And then we're going to talk about the future of what ARM is developing going forward to help further increase that performance. So first I want to just talk about what you can use embedded AI for. Um, this is something I've been working on. Um, I was assigned about a year ago, and it's one of the most exciting things I've ever gotten to work on in my career because of the possibilities of what it can do. Uh, the first big category is image classification, and it's basically what, can, what is my camera looking at? And so instead of having to have a human analyze what your camera is looking at, you can now have the embedded chip analyze what your camera is looking at. So this could be used to identify things like coffee pods or if a shelf or truck is full or not, or factory defects on a manufacturing line. So it can analyze all the parts as they go across on the conveyor belt and see if they're correct or not. Uh, even measuring produce on a supermarket scale, so it can identify bananas and know, okay, this is the price that it needs to be for a banana versus an apple versus an orange. You can also do personalization based on facial recognition. Um, embedded AI is really good for this because it's not being shared anywhere else up in the cloud or, or with anybody else necessarily. So you can use this for like appliances or the home thermostat where it'll only allow um, the adult to change the uh, thermometer and not a child uh, or t uh, customized toys where the teddy bear can recognize you, but it's, you know, much safer because that data is not going anywhere. It's just staying right inside the toy. Uh, you can also do security of video analysis where you can identify the difference between a human setting off your motion sensor versus a dog setting off your motion sensor. The second big category is audio analysis. Uh, this is where you can analyze and detect keywords, the most famous of which would be Alexa or Hey Google, but you can create your own custom keyword actions, uh, voice commands, or uh, alarm analytics. So it can detect the difference between breaking glass of a window and just normal day-to-day -day household uh, activity. Finally, Hi. you have anomaly. Hi, Anthony. Sorry, we've already had our first question come in. Um, okay. what, is, what is the difference between facial detection and facial recognition? Uh, so that is a fantastic question. So facial detection is basically just recognizing that there's a human face in front of you. So think of like your camera trying to focus, put focus on the human faces when it takes a photo. It doesn't really care who that face is, it just wants to know that there's a face there. Facial recognition is actually detecting a specific person. So if the camera has on me, then it could say, okay, you are Anthony versus uh, my wife, Jenny. Um, so that's that's the big difference there. Great, awesome. So the, uh, the last category is anomaly detection. So this is identifying factory issues before they become catastrophic. I was actually in a, uh, another webinar uh, late last week where someone was talking about how they use that in the oil and gas industry to uh, set up robots that can analyze corrosion on pipes, especially pipes that are very difficult or not easy for humans to get to. And so you can identify those problems before the pipe actually bursts and causes massive catastrophic damage. Uh, you can also do like smartwatch monitoring uh, where it um, learns your specific heartbeat or your specific health signs because we're not all the same, you know, we're all kind of different. Uh, motor performance or just any sort of sensor analysis. So instead of having to have a human analyze those sensors, or maybe it's just a very complex, you know, multiple sensors where it could, you know, take some math and um, wouldn't be straightforward to analyze. You can use AI to do that analysis on the chip itself and save time and money. So we're not going to go into details about the whole machine learning uh, process and, and what AI is and everything, but there's two key um, things I wanted to, to make sure to talk about. And that is that there's two phases for the machine learning process. The first is the training phase. This is where you collect the data that you're going to train your model on and where you do the actual training. All this occurs on a PC or in the cloud and can take a lot of time, a lot of effort, but you know, create a really great model. 
The second part is the inference phase, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And this is where you take your already created model and you're going to put it on an embedded system. And so then on the embedded system, you can take a new input from a camera or a sensor or a microphone, run it through that already created model, and then you get a new prediction that you can take action on. So you might have heard the term inference on the edge. And the idea is that the inference is using a model to make a prediction on that new data. And this data can come from an embedded camera, it can come from microphones, or it can come from sensors. So there's two possibilities. So in the old days, meaning one or two years ago, uh, the only way to really do this was inference on the cloud. So basically you took your data, you would upload it to uh, cloud services like AWS or Azure, and then your model would be running on the cloud and it would analyze that data and then send you back the result. So this requires network bandwidth, there's latency issues because you have to spend the time to upload the data and then wait for the result. And then of course there's cloud compute costs. Um, Amazon and Microsoft and other companies don't give you this time for free. So there's a better way. And that's inference on the edge. The biggest advantage here is the increased privacy and security. As I mentioned before, the data does not go anywhere besides that embedded system. So there's no chance of uh, hackers or anybody else, government agencies, grabbing that data on its way to the cloud or grabbing it while it's in the cloud. Um, so that vastly increases your privacy and security. This also gives you faster response time and throughput because you don't have to wait to upload that data, especially if it's like you know, an image, it could be quite large. Uh, that means it's also low power because it can be asleep longer because it's not waiting for that data to come back. And then, of course, it doesn't need that internet connectivity. And so you can save on your bomb costs because you don't need a Wi-Fi chip or a VLE chip or, or something like that. You can do it all locally. So now we're going to talk uh, about what NXP has enabled for machine learning. And the first one is the EIQ ML enablement. That's what the focus of this, this talk will be. Uh, so this is uh, based on open source technologies, uh, basically it's using uh, things like TensorFlow Lite or Arminin, Glow, um, and OpenCV to do that inference on an embedded system. So we support the i.mx8 family, which is a uh, MPU family of Cortex uh, A53 and um, other uh, high power ARM cores, as well as the RT 1050, 1060, and 600 families, which are Cortex M cores uh, like M7 and 33. Uh, it's integrated in our development environments. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And it's a bring your own model kind of um, idea where you have the model, you want to just run that on an embedded system. EIQ is that enablement software that allows you to do that. We're going to talk much more detail about that later on in this presentation. The other options, uh, we have some third party software and hardware partners. Um, the Coral Dev Board you might have heard of from Google uh, uses our Google TPUs um, to do really, really fast inferencing. Uh, we have a development kit for Amazon Alexa voice services. We have a partner called Ozone that helps develop your models if you need that help, um, as well as sensor analysis tools and, and much more. And then finally, we have our turnkey solutions. So this is where you don't want to build your own model or you don't have that uh, ML expertise inside uh, your company or you don't want to you know, hire that out. So with these turnkey solutions already include the model, already include everything you need to get up and running pretty much immediately with using Alexa voice services, local voice control, or facial and emotional recognition. So I'm gonna head over to Cobus to talk about the ARM Cortex M portfolio that's gonna be powering and doing all the calculations for these ML models. Thanks, Anthony. Um, yes, so this is an overview of the ARM Cortex M portfolio. Um, a lot of you may be very familiar with the, these devices going back um, um, quite a number of years. Um, and, um, you know, there's ones like the M0 Plus, M4, which is very popular in the market. Um, and um, we generally classify our processes into three main categories. The, the ones aimed at the lowest power, lowest area, lowest cost applications. And these are the M0, M0 Plus and the new M23. Then the sort of mid-range where we focus on having a good balance between performance and efficiency. And there we have the M3, M4, M33, and the M55, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then our high performance um, family, which at this stage is only one, but there's more um, coming on our roadmap, the M7. So the 
devices that um, are, are of particular interest in terms of devices that are available today. These are products that you can buy, go and buy from um, NXP and, and many other vendors or the M33 and M7, which are particularly suited for um, machine learning applications. On the right hand side, you'll see the way we've started positioning these products. So traditionally we've always shown um, just relative um, DMIRBs or core mark performance, so control code type of applications. But what we've done now is, is on the X axis, we've started to show the relative machine learning and DSP performance as well. And <clears throat> just to tell you why the DSP part is also um, important is that in many of these applications, you need to do some DSP before you actually run your machine learning model. So if you think about audio, um, you want to clean up the signal by doing noise reduction, echo cancellation, beam forming, uh, these types of DSP functions. So that's why the DSP is also important. Um, so I've highlighted the ones that are particularly suited for um, machine learning and DSP applications, the M4, M33, and M7. Um, but um, I can just point out that um, any of these processes can be used for machine learning. Obviously, they have different performance levels, but um, they are all uh, suitable for machine learning applications. Next slide. So I'm just going to touch on the two processes that um, that are used in in the um, NXP turnkey solutions or um, in, in some of the NXP solutions and specifically the turnkey solutions. So the Cortex M7, which is part of the 1050, 1060, 1160 families, um, this is our very high end processor. It's a super scalar processor. So what it can do is it can dual issue instructions. So depending on the instructions, if there's no dependency, it can dual issue instructions. And then that, that allows it to, to achieve um, over five core marks per megahertz. Um, it can also be clocked very fast. So um, in uh, 60 nanometers, it can be clocked over one gigahertz. And in fact, um, NXP is really bringing products to market, microcontrollers that run over gigahertz. Um, to give you some idea, when I started playing with microcontrollers, um, you know, they were running at four megahertz, eight megahertz, and then you know, I was astounded when they could run at 16 megahertz. To think now that you could run it at the gigahertz is, is just phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> so despite these uh, performance improvements on the M7, it still retains all the benefits of the ARM family, ARM Cortex-M family with ease of use. It's fully backwards compatible in terms of code, as well as the low interrupt latency and real-time performance. Um, one thing to note when you're trying to execute, when you're trying to get this type of performance, you need the memory subsystems uh, and, and interfaces to be able to feed the CPU at a, at a rate that, that you can get that sustained performance. And for that, we have um, up to a 16 megabyte uh, um, tightly coupled memory for both code and data. So what you'll do is you'll put your, your critical code in the TCM and that can be accessed uh, with zero weight state um, and execute it as fast as possible without having to have contention on the bus in case there's some other bus masters as well. In addition, we can have up to a 64K instruction data cache. So um, <clears throat> any other code that um, may be part of the application or the communication stack, that you still want to execute as fast as possible by utilizing the cache. You can then, once it's in the cache, of course, you'll, you'll get a zero weight state um, access to, to the that code and data. It also supports the AXI4 bus interface to um, provide the sustained throughput. Um, some of the other things, it has a floating point unit <coughs> with both single precision and double precision uh, support. And with the uh, super scalar architecture, it can support uh, two 32 bit or two 16 bit max per cycle. It also supports the DSP extensions which are used for um, a lot of the uh, pre-processing required for the machine learning models. Next slide. So the M33 is um, <coughs> um, one of the newest processes we have in the portfolio. It was actually introduced quite a few years ago and it took some time to, to come to market, but now there's uh, several uh, products available, microcontrollers available based on the ARM 
Codex M33. Um, it is quite similar to the ARM Cortex uh, M4 um, with the same type of three-stage pipeline Harvard architecture, but um, with a lot of the enhancements, it now um, provides a 20% performance uplift over the M4. Um, but the main addition and why we did the M33 is that we add a trust zone. So as the IoT exploded and people started connecting devices to the internet, the issue of security became more um, important. Um, if you have a standalone device uh, and someone wants to hack it, if he has to have physical access to it. But if you have a connected device, then there is a possibility that someone can remotely hack into your device and, um, and, and do bad things. So um, with Trust Zone, we, um, we added uh, this capability to, uh, to segment your, your system, your memory, and your peripherals between a secure and non-secure environment, <clears throat> and um, thereby protect the, the critical pieces of the system um, that's used for um, encryption and identification. It also has a DSP unit with um, SIMD, or single instruction multiple data type of instructions, a single cycle MAC, and then also the floating point unit. Uh, two extra features that's also new on the <clears throat> M33 is the co-process interface. And some of our partners have taken advantage of, uh, of that to implement accelerators to, Im to accelerate certain functions. So <clears throat> things that you can do is accelerate certain DSP functions, certain math functions like sine and cosine, um, or even some uh, machine learning functions. So um, you can actually um, uh, extend the capabilities by um, doing some of these <clears throat> operations in hardware and um, greatly uh, um, increasing the performance. And then the other new thing, which is <clears throat> coming to market soon is ARM custom instructions. So the M33 is the first processor that supports ARM custom instructions. <clears throat> And this allows uh, designers to add um, instructions that um, can replace a number of instructions and thereby greatly uh, accelerate certain um, parts of the code um, or, or give you more energy efficiency. And it also supports a powerful debug with uh, non-intrusive trace with embedded trace macro cell and the micro trace buffer. Thanks. So hi, hi, Cobus Anthony. Before we move on to um, Anthony's next section, um, Cobus, we've had a couple of questions come in on the chat, so I just thought let's let's address them now. Yeah. Um, so the ARM Cortex M7, Cortex M33 are deterministic devices along with low interrupt latency. Is that correct? Yes. And they're not A, a class devices that use a Linux OS. It, sorry, what's the last part? Um, they're not A Cortex A class devices that use a Linux OS. Oh, sorry, Linux. Oh, yes. No, they cannot run Linux. They don't have an MMU. Um, you would typically use an RTOS to on the on these devices. Okay. Um, Ravi asked, um, "Is the TCM supported in Cortex M33?" I think is it tightly coupled memories he's referring yes. to there. Um, no, it's not supported. So the TCM typically has a dedicated bus, so you don't have contention over the AXI bus. But if, if you look at our core stone reference design, we've actually implemented a, a type of TCM on that where we <clears throat> have a bypass. So you, you, you have some memory which acts as a TCM. So it can be done. Um, and if you use that reference design, we'll show you exactly how to do that. Great, thank you. Um, and Ravi also mentioned about um, the differences between M33 and M55. And I was just going to mention, we have a, some more detail on the Cortex M55 coming up later in the presentation. Um, yes. So yeah, great. And um, I, sorry, I have two more questions come in from Thomas. Um, okay. Uh, the optimi optimization made between TensorFlow and Google, is that based on DSP? Uh, so the, the Google uh, TPU is actually their own custom hardware, um, but there are some optimizations that we'll cover uh, about how we can optimize the running of TensorFlow uh, light on the ARM Cortex uh, processors. Great. Okay. Great. And then final question that's just come in right now. Um, Trust Zone, which is available in M33, M23, and M55, um, it offers a better performance or safety in terms of memory ma management. 
And so trust zone in itself doesn't affect the performance. Um, it, it just um, uh, <coughs> segments your memory between secure and non-secure. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Um, offers better performance or safety. Oh, the safety part, yes. So it, it does offer a few safety features, um, like there's um, stack limit checking and the fact that you have, um, uh, that you can segregate code that, that may be more, you want more protected in, you can place that in the secure um, memory. Um, and so that does offer some safety features. Um, and in fact, we do have a safety package available for the M33 as well. Great, thank you. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about EIQ, which is the uh, NXP enablement and inference engines to run these models on an embedded system. Uh, so basically this is kind of the uh, diagram of the machine learning process where you have your, your definition that's gonna be written in one of the many ML frameworks available like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, et cetera. And then you're gonna take that framework and you're gonna train it, you're gonna optimize it. And then there's a conversion process usually to turn that model into something that can be loaded onto an embedded system. And then EIQ is the part that's running on uh, the Cortex-M devices that will take that model and be able to, to run it. And so we have a couple of different options with uh, EIQ um, that we offer with Simpsys and N, TensorFlow Lite, and Glow, and we'll talk more about those a little bit later. But the basic idea is that EIQ is this collection of libraries and tools for building machine learning embedded applications. So it's using that open source inference engines, um, supporting emerging neural net compilers like Glow, um, and it's a bring your own model kind of um, system where you take an already existing model that either you built or maybe you've uh, got a research model online and you tweaked it for your particular application and now you can run it on an embedded system. Uh, it's all integrated in our uh, MCU Expresso SDK for the Cortex-M devices, uh, which is a software um, drivers, examples, and middleware uh, that we offer uh, complimentary on our website. Uh, if you're running an i.mx processor, which is our higher end processors running Cortex-A devices, then it's included as part of the Linux distribution for those. And then of course, there's a lot of documentation that we have available on our website and our community for users guides, demo guides, um, reference manuals, um, guidelines for importing those models, uh, and a lot of training collateral. So one of those uh, pieces of documentation and collateral to help you get up and running is a, uh, a demo that I'm gonna show uh, right now. We'll see how, how this works as a, as a live virtual demo. Uh, but basically, it's taking a mobile net model, which is a very standard image classification model. Uh, it's written in TensorFlow. And by default, mobile net recognizes a thousand different categories of images. Uh, but we shrunk it down to identify five different uh, flower types, because that was the data that was available uh, to, to retrain it on. So it's using EIQ uh, to run this model on an RT1060 uh, board. Um, it's a Cortex-M7 based device. Uh, this lab is, is all online, um, so I'm going to see stop sharing and then switch my camera to this. So I already have the model loaded. And you can see I have some flowers and hopefully you'll be able to see, let's see here. That's identifying this as a rose. That's a little bit blown out. Let's see if I can adjust. Um, but that was a rose. Uh, if you have a sunflower, I'm trying to turn it off this. Yeah, it looks like the, the screen's really blown out with this, this webcam. The secondary webcam isn't the best. Um, but if you could see it, well, uh, basically you'd see the sunflower and the uh, screen, and it would identify what it's looking at. Uh, there is a video online uh, that's uh, Armin retweeted uh, if you want to get a, a much better, clearer video of what, what I just showed.
And of course, we also have the lab. Let me share my screen again. All right. Oop. Okay, so uh, so that was all using the EEQ enablement to run an already existing model. So there's a lot of different options. That was a TensorFlow model, so it was using the TensorFlow Lite inference engine. Uh, but we also have uh, other options like Glow or Arminit. And what's available depends on the class of processor. So for a Cortex-M, you have TensorFlow Lite and Glow. For a Cortex-A, which are a higher performance processor, you have that can run Linux. You have things like Arm and In and the Onyx runtime, as well as still TensorFlow Lite. You can also make use of the MX accelerators on some of these devices, um, like the NPU. Because um, something to keep in mind is that there's no necessarily special module to run a model on an embedded system. Uh, it's basically all just math. But just like a DSP can increase the or uh, increase the performance of you doing FFTs. A neural network accelerator or a DSP can be reused to speed up the math calculations that are done to do a um, machine learning on the edge. So I mentioned that these are all in open source software. So one of the questions is, well, can I just you know take this open source software and run it, run it on my own device? And what do I need to use EIQ? And the short answer is you, you don't have to. But EIQ does make it much, much easier, and there are performance improvements as well that we've implemented. So uh, we're going to talk about census and in here in a second, uh, but it's a you know optimized library that can speed up these map calculations on, on the Cortex M cores. And so you can get a significant performance increase uh, when running the TensorFlow Lite with these optimizations that we've built into it over the original uh, TensorFlow Lite uh, code. Uh, also, the biggest thing is that these inference engines work out of the box and are already tested and already optimized. Uh, so it makes it very, very trivial to take your own model and run it on an, our embedded systems. So you get up and running in minutes instead of weeks. Uh, it's basically just importing the project, you click the compile button, you click the program button, and now you're using embedded ML uh, within minutes. Uh, versus a roll your own where you have to download all the source, figure out which of that source is important for an embedded system, set up the cross compiler, um, set up the camera input code, set up the LCD output code, make sure it all works nice together and there's no bugs, and then you can finally use, use that output. So that's, that's the big advantage of, of using EIQ and using these pre-tested and pre-optimized uh, solutions. So as I mentioned, um, the you know, you would take your pre-trained model and on the PC you would do your optimizations and then convert that to a format compatible uh, with uh, EIQ and these embedded uh, inference engines. And there, we have instructions for all that. And then on the actual device, you have your camera input or a microphone or a sensor, like an accelerometer, humidity sensor, magnetometer, any, any sort of sensor that you could think of. And you can use that as the input to your model and then you use that to make a prediction. And so there's three different inference engines available. Um, which one you use would depend on your particular needs or what uh, framework your model's using. Um, so we're going to cover all those uh, right now. And we're going to start with uh, Simpsons and N and how ARM uses that to support TensorFlow Lite. So Kobus, you want to take that? Take that. Um, so um, ARM's focus is on TensorFlow Lite Micro. So um, with uh, TensorFlow, the, the models are typically big, and then they came up with TensorFlow Lite, which had smaller models, and now um, we're talking about TensorFlow Lite Micro. So this is really aimed at exactly the things that uh, Anthony and I discussed earlier, running these uh, TensorFlow Lite models on a microcontroller. So CMSIS NN is our neural network library. Um, and it's, if you're familiar with some of the other CMSYS libraries like CMSYS DSP, um, it's, it's a library that ARM created that's open source that's available for uh, anyone to use free of charge. Um, so the API, um, we provide an API and then there's a common functions or operators that we've implemented like convolution, fully connected, pooling and activation. 
um, and these have been optimized uh, so that it's, uh, it runs as efficiently as possible. We also provide the, the scripts to convert, convert these models to CMN, CMSS in and API calls. And as I say, from ARM's point of view, we, we, we're focusing on TF Lite Micro. So the CMSS NN is highly optimized for um, inference engines like TF Lite Micro. Next slide. So um, with, with, with the, these libraries, we aim for best in class performance and um, we provide a consistent interface across all the Cortex M CPUs extending to V8M and now the latest V8.1M. Um, it is available open source uh, via Apache license and you can go and download it there if you want to uh, experiment with it. Um, and the main thing is, is as I said, these are um, highly optimized. And to give you some idea of the optimization levels that we have achieve, achieved. So if you take uh, TensorFlow Lite my, Micro and you just compile that code, um, C code, um, and you compare it to what you can get using um, CMSS libraries, you see that depending on the type of network, we get anywhere from a 2.5 to close to six times improvement in um, run, runtime improvement. Um, so it's a reduction in cycles. Um, and then on average, we get about a 4.6 times higher performance. Um, what's also important in a lot of um, ML at the edge applications is energy improvement or energy efficiency. So um, if, you, if you have a sensor that's running off a battery and you're trying to do machine learning on that sensor, then energy efficiency is critical. And, and there you see that we get even higher on average um, performance improvement uh, close to five times on average. Next slide. So something I haven't mentioned before, and I'll talk a little bit later about that is uh, something called a micro MPU. And I just need to explain what that is and how it fits into this picture. So just as um, you can do um, graphics on a general purpose uh, CPU, um, people have found that if you use a GPU, which is hardware, which is optimized to do graphics, it's more efficient, it's much faster. And the, the same is true for a lot of machine learning tasks. So um, ARM introduced, um, first we introduced uh, neural network processes for high-end applications. And then earlier this year, we introduced our first micro MPU. So you can see that as a, an accelerator block, a hardware block that is dedicated to, to running uh, certain um, operators in hardware and doing it much more efficiently. So the, the flow that you would typically have in a complete system is that you would have your TensorFlow Lite um, input file, um, you put through a, an offline optimization tool, which would convert that to a modified tool, which is now optimized to take advantage of the underlying hardware. So in the case where you do have a, a micro MPU um, and it would send all the operators supported by the micro MPU um, to be executed on the micro MPU, um, the ones that are not supported by the micro MPU would then be <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the optimization tool would look and see whether those are available in CMSS NN and it would <clears throat> then run that on the Cortex M processor, any, any of the ones that you choose. And then um, if there's ones that's not supported by CMSS NN either, um, it would just compile that code. So um, if you don't have a micro MPU in the system, then it would just follow the second arrow. It would try and use as much of CMS as any as possible. And then any other um, operators that's not supported, it would just um, compile and run on the Cortex M. Thanks. Thanks, Tobus. Anthony, before you move on, and um, we've just had a couple more questions. Um, It'd be good to you guys to address. Yeah. Um, this one's probably for Cobus. Um, how is CMSIS NN used in conjunction with CMSIS DSP? Um, so it's two libraries um, that um, have two different functions. So CMSIS DSP um, implement a lot of um, filter and, and, and DSP like functions that you would use for the pre-processing in, in, in a typical system. So if you think about um, something where you want to do keyword spotting, uh, CMSIS DSP would be used for things like the, the beam forming, the noise reduction, the echo cancellation, uh, the voice detection, uh, 
Um, and then once you've detected that there is voice, um, you would then pass it on to the keyword spotting engine, which is the machine learning model that you've implemented. Um, and that would utilize CMSS NN to, um, to run that optimally. Great, thank you. And then um, I have a question for you, Anthony. Um, is there a way to do transfer learning included in the EIQ project? Something like having an API or script or something that can easily run and repurpose the pre-trained model? Yeah, so we, we have some examples of doing that, that transfer learning um, and there's several more examples online. Um, we don't have a specific tool for that uh, right now, but that's something that we're, we're investigating. Uh, but transfer learning is a very common ML um, and AI um, operation. And so there's a lot of information out there. And, and again, it's going to be very model specific on how exactly that would work for that particular model. But we, we do have examples. Great. Thank you. Carry on. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about then uh, EIQ's uh, TensorFlow. So TensorFlow, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, as a uh, ML framework developed by Google. Uh, so TensorFlow is where you do the training and inference. And then we have TensorFlow Lite for EIQ, which is kind of the NXP's implementation of TF Lite for MCUs. And then what Copus was just talking about, TensorFlow Lite Micro is kind of TensorFlow's implementation of TF Lite for MCUs. So they, they both try to accomplish the same thing of running TensorFlow models on an embedded system. Uh, the thing to remember with TensorFlow Lite is it can only be used with TensorFlow models and that there's a TF Lite convert utility, uh, which is provided by TensorFlow, that converts a full TensorFlow model to a TF Lite flat buffer uh, binary. Then you basically take that binary and you put that into the embedded system, and the TF Lite inference engine that's running on the IDENMX RT in this case is what is going to interpret that model and take in the new data. So that demo I had just showed, that's, that's running TensorFlow Lite. So the steps is taking that initial file, running the TF convert, creating the TF Lite flat buffer. Then you use a simple program called XD or there's several other on Linux that can take a binary and just basically convert that into a C array that you put into a header file. Then you just take that header file and put that into your EIQ project and now you're running a brand new model. So this makes it very trivial to be able to load a new model onto your embedded system. So the code kind of looks like this. Uh, you can see it's not too much um, really that, that the user needs to, to do. Um, the key one is importing the model, just including that header file. And then uh, there's a build from buffer API that you just give the, uh, the model name to, and it loads the model into memory. And then for the actual application, uh, in this case, we're using a camera to get the um, image data. Um, so again, this is all included as part of the EAQ uh, demo software. That's that's part of the MC Express SDK. The actual inference is a simple API call to invoke, and then you can get the results. So this is just uh, some benchmark numbers showing um, the optimizations of using Simpsons NN and the DSP on the uh, M7 core that's running all this, because again, um, you're you're running. Um, all these models are just running math. So any sort of hardware that you have on the chip that can optimize those math calculations is going to increase your performance. And before you move on, Anthony, I've just got a couple more sure. questions come in. Uh, what is the main difference in implementation between TF Lite and, uh, sorry, let me say that again. What is the main difference in implementation between TF Lite from TensorFlow and EIQ? Uh, so they're, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, the main things is we have added a couple of other um, uh, optimizations beyond some in, in there. Um, and just the enablement that we have around it. Uh, you know, when you have your EIQ TensorFlow light and you have a whole demo that has the camera support, has the LCD support, has microphone support already built into that. Um, so that's, that's going to be the biggest difference. Great. And just one more that's come in. And um, how do you manage memory while running the inferencing on microcontrollers? So that's a really good question. So it depends on which inference engine you're running. Uh, in TensorFlow Lite's case, uh, it basically allocates uh, a bunch of memory from the heap, and then it dynamically allocates it as it needs it. 
Um, and Glow, which I was about to talk about here in a second, it's all statically uh, allocated at compile time. And um, the amount of memory that's going to be used is extremely model dependent. You can't say, you know, oh, a image classification model will take this much memory because it varies wildly depending on um, the size of the images that it's going to analyze, how many classifications it's going to do, um, the accuracy and how it's structured. Um, so that's what makes this a bit challenging, to be honest, is that there's a lot of trade-offs that you have to make as you develop your application of, you know, I can get, you know, 5% more accuracy, but it's going to take double the RAM. Um, so what is that trade-off worth? And then, you know, that's just kind of random numbers, but that's the kind of thing that you have to think about. Um, and that's also what limits, you know, what models can run on that particular processor. Again, it's all mass, so it theoretically could run on anything from an N0 to a, you know, high-end server CPU. Um, but it's just a matter of how long is it going to take to do that math uh, for that particular core or that particular, you know, GPU. And also, is there enough memory to store the model and to store all the uh, intermediate calculations and, um, and the inputs and the outputs. And so that's really your limiting factor in regards to memory. And that's why you typically see ML on these, you know, kind of higher end M7 processors um, versus an M0 processor. Great, thank you. Um, and one more question, they keep coming in. Um, how does TensorFlow Lite EIQ compare to TensorFlow Lite for MCUs in terms of supported operations and features? Um, I believe they would support the same operations because they come from the same base code. Uh, basically EIQ, we just, we had started this process like two years ago and before micro even existed. And so we kind of, um, you know, took that development and ran with it. And so that's why there's um, the, the two versions. Great. Thank you. But we're, we're constantly updating it to make sure we stay in sync with the latest TensorFlow. That's good. Great questions. All right, so now I want to talk about Glow, uh, which is a, another option for doing inference on embedded systems uh, with, with the IQ. So again, you can pick different inference engines. Um, so this one's developed by Facebook. Um, and right now it's not currently available, but it is coming out next, uh, beginning of next month. Uh, and this is a compiler that turns a model into machine executable binary for a target device. So both the model and the inference engine are compiled into a single binary. Um, and this allows you to then integrate that binary that uh, was generated into an S2K project and quickly run your model. And the real big advantage with this is it can make use of compiler optimization. So things like loop unrolling or um, other you know, classical compiler optimizations you can now do for your model. Uh, this supports Onyx as a model input, which is a universal model format. So you can convert a TensorFlow model to Onyx, you can convert a PyTorch model to Onyx, you can convert a CAFE model to Onyx. Um, or CAFE2 models uh, directly. And this is some really cutting edge stuff. It's been really, really exciting to work on. So you can see that you can get some really uh, impressive comparison, uh, performance comparisons. So this is um, GLOW, same model, uh, CIFAR10, which is a very simple um, image classification model. Um, you know, TF Lite versus GLOW with the Simpsons and in optimizations. So like Cobus was saying, some system in can also be used to optimize other inference engines, and so we used it with Glow. So anytime that it Glow, the compiler runs across an operation that can be optimized with some system in, then it makes that call instead of the normal um, uh, assembly calls. So, and this is, uh, you know, we, on the RT685, uh, we have a Hi Fi 4 DSP. Uh, Kobe has mentioned that, you know, the M33 core has the option of a code processor. So for our RT-685, we added a uh, high-speed DSP, and that can be used then to optimize and increase the performance of these uh, machine learning models. So whether it's a floating point model or a quantized model, um, you can see that there's a significant performance increase um, by using uh, both Simpsons and N and the hi fi 4 DSP. And uh, quantized is, is just means that the uh, most models are trained in floating point weights and floating point data, and quantized is turning that floating point data into int 8 data. So it basically makes your weight size uh, one fourth the original size, which saves memory, and it also, doing floating point math, it takes longer usually than doing um, fixed point math. And so it can increase your performance by quantizing a model. And if you do this right, it should not affect the accuracy that much. 
So the process is you take a uh, you know model like a TensorFlow model, you can then convert that to the Onyx format, and then Glow or sorry EIQ provides these tools called Image Classifier, which uh, converts that uh, basically creates a quantization profile that you then feed into the model compiler tool. And this model compiler tool is what does the actual compilation of the model, and that spits out a binary as well as a weights file, and then you just take those files and import them into your EIQ. Uh, project and so it looks a bit like this where you just have you know take that uh, compiled file add that to your project uh, it creates a header file that you add that contains some defines and then it's very straightforward where you just there's basically a buffer that's created that you just put your input data um, in that particular memory location you run the inference by just calling a simple API with the model name and then you can get the result by just reading in a different pointer uh, that contains the results. And so it's very trivial to add this kind of functionality to an already existing project or to just build a whole project around this. And uh, we talked a little bit about memory usage earlier, but Glow does not use dynamically allocated memory. All the requirements are actually in the header file that's generated. and um, where it has the model weights, the input and output sizes, and then of course the scratch memory, because it has to do a whole bunch of math and save the results and use that for the next layer and so on and so forth. So getting EIQ, uh, if you're interested in trying this, if you want to try running your models on an embedded system or just run the examples of image classification and keyword spotting that we have built in, uh, it's included as part of our MCU Expresso SDK. Uh, again, that's our uh, drivers, example programs, everything you, all the software you need to get up and running with your board. Uh, you just want to make sure that EIQ is selected uh, when you do the MC Express SDK Builder. Uh, so you can either select that specifically or just click the Select All button that selects all our middleware because we have a lot of really great partners and really great um, you know, file systems, USB, BLE, um, lots of uh, options uh, as well. So there's several EIQ examples in the SDK of CFAR 10's uh, 30, simple 32 by 32 image from the camera. Um, you have keyword spotting. Uh, there's a built-in microphone on the 1060 SD, uh, EVK uh, to recognize things, uh, 10 simple words like yes, no, up, down. Um, there's a mobile net uh, label image demo. It takes an 128 by 128 pixel image. And then we also have an anomaly detection demo with an optional sensor board that uses the accelerometer and it can learn, you basically take the accelerometer, uh, record the data from that, and then use that to train a model, and then use that model to detect um, you know, anomalies in accelerometer, accelerometer data for your particular application. The photo structure, basically you download the SDK, it's a zip file, if you unzip it, then you have uh, folders for the AQ examples and you know because this is all open source software we also have the source code for all the engines and examples as well. We also have several app notes uh, for using anomaly detection. We have a handwritten digit recognition app note so you can draw digits on the LCD screen and it'll recognize them and tell you what they are. Uh, and then uh, someone had a question about transfer learning. We actually have a, a whole app note uh, that we're going to we're creating. Uh, about doing the transfer learning uh, using this actually this handwritten digit recognition because they they took a model and then were able to to train it with uh, custom handwriting. Uh, one of the very common questions is how long does it take to do this inference or what kind of performance can I expect? Um, the big thing I want to uh, convey is that this is very very heavily dependent on a particular model. Um, so depending on how big the um, input of the data is, how many layers it is, um, how, many, what, how many classification inputs or outputs you have, uh, it's gonna make a very large difference. Um, one thing to note though, is that once you have a model, then feeding it different data, different photos, that inference time will be the same. So it's not data input dependent on a particular image, it's just you know, what's the size of that image, and then of course, what the model is made up of. So just give an idea of kind of the, the times um, you can see, the, you know, glow um, on the RT685 with that DSP acceleration versus the 1060 um, versus TensorFlow Lite for the different models. Um, but again, all each EIQ example uh, reports that inference time. So you can very easily take your model that you're interested in, run it, and it'll tell you how long it took. 
Uh, same thing with memory requirements. I kind of already touched on this where, you know, in Flash, you need the model, the inference engine code, and it, that input data or, you know, the, the camera code. Um, and then the RAM, you would need to store the intermediate layers or intermediate products of the model layers. And again, this is extremely model dependent. Um, so asking, you know, how much memory do I need for image classification? It's, you know, again, what's the size of the image? How many um, classifications do you, are you interested in? And, and, you know, some images are going to be much more complicated than others to be able to classify and therefore take a much bigger model. So it's extremely application and model dependent. But just to give you an idea, you know, this is what kind of limits how low you can go on a, a embedded system because there are some, you know, pretty decent memory requirements. So now I'm going to head it off to, to Cobus to talk about the future uh, that ARM has planned for increasing and further increasing the ML performance on the edge. Yes, thanks. So most of our talk today was talking about things you can do today with uh, microcontrollers that's available um, and, uh, you know, uh, tools and everything that's available today. So you can go and, and experiment. But also wanted to give you some idea of what's coming in the future. So in February, we announced two new products, the Cortex M55 and the Ethos U55, the micro MPU um, that I uh, talked about a little bit earlier. And um, on this graph, we've just taken that um, uh, chart that I showed earlier and um, now extended that to show the relative performance for machine learning and DSP for the M55 and then if you combine the M55 with the U55. So um, <clears throat> the M55 in terms of um, control code performance sort of fits between the M33 and M7, but in terms of DSP and ML performance, it outperforms the M7 significantly. And then if you combine the M55 with the Ethos U55, um, specifically for machine learning performance, you get an enormous boost on top of that. Uh, just want to mention the, the micro MPU can be used with, with any microcontroller, but um, it's AXI based, so it works better with something like an M7 or M55. If you wanted to use it with a M33 or M4, then you would need a, a, a bridge to be able to do that from AHB to AXI. Next slide. And just to give you some idea of what type of performance increase you can get um, with these uh, devices that are now designed specifically for DSP and machine learning workloads. So in terms of the DSP performance, so that is doing all the signal cleanup before you do your machine learning. Um, you can expect about a five times um, performance improvement in signal processing. And then if you just use the M55, uh, you could expect about a 15 times performance improvement. And this is using int eight um, data types. Um, and then if you combine the M55 and the U55, you could get a, a nearly 500 times uh, performance improvement um, for the highest end ethos U55. There's different versions available, smaller versions where you may not need that type of uh, performance. But um, the, the message here is, is that um, in the next year, um, you know, you'll see products coming to market that based on the M55 and U55, that will greatly enhance what can be done at the edge on a very small cost-effective Cortex-M processor. Thanks, Kobus. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, there's a, several links in the presentation that I think will, will be shared um, so you can, can click on all these. Uh, of finding out more information about NXP, ZIQ, and the different inference engines, as well as some basic machine learning courses, um, and a really funny and interesting book about AI um, that I really enjoyed reading. It's not terribly technical, but it gives you a really good idea of what AI can do and the still limitations of it. Um, the link to the uh, Git repos for all the um, engines that we talked today, uh, about today, and then uh, the NXP EIQ resources, um, including the, the um, link to get the SDK, the transfer learning lab, the demo I just showed, and, and some of the app apps. 
So that brings us to the, the end of the talk. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining and I guess I'll hand it over to, to Rachel to, to finish up. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Cobus. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in in the last sort of 10 minutes, but I'm just conscious that we're on the hour and I, um, people may have other meetings and things to get to. So um, we'll end it there and we'll answer questions offline. Um, we're probably going to do a, um, a post or something with all the questions answered. So if anyone misses um, missed the answer to the, some of the open questions, we'll address them um, and send out links and everything after that. So yeah, yeah thank you. Thank uh, you. Everyone. Rachel, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stay online and if Anthony can stay online as well, we yeah. can um, continue to answer questions on the, on the chat, on the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, certainly we can do that. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining today's Tech Talk. Um, we, this is the first of the series, as I mentioned, and um, our next Tech Talk is in a couple of weeks um, and it's on TinyML development with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers and Simpsons and N and that's yeah, Tuesday the 30th of June, same time. Um, after today's recording, um, as I mentioned, uh, we'll do a blog with some of our questions and things, but we're also um, going to be posting this on ARM's YouTube channel. Um, and you'll also receive a link to a quick survey that we'd love you to complete just to make sure um, if there's any topics in the future that you'd like us to cover, um, if you can enter that into the survey, that'd be great. Okay, so we'll end it there. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Cobus. Um, and have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.